Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Welcome back to the forum webinar series. I'm Jennifer Sandy, Senior Director of Preservation Programs at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And in case you don't know, Preservation Leadership Forum is the professional membership program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This webinar series is made possible by members of Preservation Leadership Forum, and we sincerely thank those of you who are with us today. The webinar is also produced in partnership with the National Trust's Where Women Made History Initiative, the Historic Artists Homes and Studios Program, and the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. And my colleague Priya is putting links in the chat as we talk, so feel free to check out any of these that we're mentioning now. We're so excited to present today's webinar, From Endangered Place to Community Asset, updates on three 11 most endangered historic places. Today's webinar focuses on what happens after a site is included on the National Trust's endangered list and shares key studies of how three formerly private homes are being transformed into centers of community life. Before we begin, here are a few technical logistics. We will take questions from the audience during the webinar. Please send questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to submit at any point during the webinar but we'll be waiting until the Q&A section to answer questions. You are also encouraged to communicate to all participants through the chat function. The closed captioning function is enabled for this webinar. You can enable it and disable it either through the controls at the bottom of your screen or through your audio settings, depending on what version of Zoom you're using. Following the program, we'll send out a recording of today's webinar directly to the email address that you use to register and finally, all forum webinars are available on our YouTube channel. As a reminder, we ask that everyone is respectful to each other in the chat and follow our code of conduct. The link is posted in the chat. Next slide, please. So before I turn it over to our presenters today, I'd like to share some brief background information about the National Trust's America's 11 Most Endangered Historic Places program. The 11 Most program uplifts and catalyzes community-led preservation work through a high-impact public awareness campaign, resulting in increased visibility, public attention, and new resources to save and activate historic places for the public good. It's the National Trust's largest annual advocacy campaign and also one of our longest running programs. The first list was announced in 1988. Since that time, we have brought much needed attention to over 350 places across the United States and territories and even a few international sites. The media spotlight and public awareness raised through endangered designation has proven to be a powerful tool for local advocates to rally public support, create pressure on decision makers for a change of course and attract new supporters to the cause. And we're gonna hear a lot more about how that has worked from our presenters today. Next slide, please. But first, I want to announce that we will soon begin accepting nominations for the 2025 list of 11 Most Endangered. Nominations will open on September 10th and are due by October 8th. The 2025 list of 11 Most Endangered Places will be announced in May 2025. Each year, the list is selected from nominations submitted by members of the public and organizations working to identify and protect important places in their communities. When evaluating nominations, our team considers factors including significance, local support for preservation, the urgency of the threat, and the potential solutions to that threat, including the broader impact that an endangered designation might have on saving and activating the place. Places do not need to be nationally significant or famous to make the list. We're looking for places that matter to people in you, your community. As part of the National Trust's continued commitment to telling the full American story, we particularly invite nominations for historic places that highlight a unique or overlooked aspect of American history and that expand our understanding of our shared national heritage. To that end, we welcome nominations of historic places important to communities who are historically underrepresented within preservation, including but not limited to places associated with women, immigrants, Asian Americans, Black Americans, Latin A Americans, Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and LGBTQ communities. 
We also particularly invite nominations for historic places that are facing threats related to the impacts of climate change. Check out our website for more information and a link to the nomination form at savingplaces.org backslash 11 most. Next slide, please. So today we will hear from representatives of three places recently included on the 11 most endangered list. Each of these places has its own unique and powerful story, but they also have a few other things in common. They are places that help illuminate various aspects of women's history and achievements, and they are all formerly private homes being reimagined and activated for the use and benefit of their communities. Here are today's presenters. I'm gonna share short bios and full bios will be available in the chat. Robin G. Peterson has been a director of the Museum of Riverside since 2017, where she is at work on institutional reinvention, rehabilitation and expansion of the downtown Riverside site and restoration of the National Historic Landmark, Arata House. Dr. Peterson is a committed advocate for the value of lifelong learning through the ideas and objects human beings have created and the natural world they inhabit. Yafet Smith is a screenwriter, lawyer, and documentary filmmaker based in Austin, Texas. He serves as president of the Key Smith Foundation, the nonprofit steward of the L.V. Hall Home and Studio, and VP of Curation for the Arts Foundation of Kosciuszko, which is developing the L.V. Hall Legacy Center. Annalise Flynn is an independent curator and arts administrator based in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Her current clients include the Kohler Foundation, for whom she manages Spaces Archives, saving and preserving arts and cultural environments, the world's largest repository of archival documentation related to artist-built environments, the Arts Foundation of Kosciuszko, and the Keysmith Foundation. And finally, Lindsay Liebman is an Emmy award-winning journalist that has spent more than 22 years in broadcast television as a news anchor and reporter, and is currently the evening news anchor at NBC affiliate KCEN-TV in the Waco Temple Killeen television market. In 2022, she started the nonprofit Cindy Walker Foundation in her hometown of Mejia, Texas, to preserve and promote the legacy of Country Music Hall of Fame, Cindy Walker. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Peterson. Thanks. Good morning or afternoon for everyone. Next slide, please. Uh, welcome to my attempt to compress a dense history into a few minutes. The story of the National Historic Landmark Carrada House in Riverside, California, is one that touches on a range of topics from racism and social justice to the notions of home and community. Next slide, please. The house now known as Harada House was built as a one-story bungalow in the 1880s. Japanese immigrant Jukichi Harada bought it in late 1915 and deeded it in the names of his three U.S.-born toddler children. He was well aware of California's 1913 alien land law that prevented immigrants such as himself from owning property. And Jukichi immediately had a second story built and the family moved in. Just as immediately the family mobilized against the fam or the neighborhood mobilized against the family, family and the state of California sued on the grounds of violation of the alien land law. After two years, a trial taking place during World War I, the family prevailed in Superior Court in Riverside. During World War II, the Harada family faced the same fate as 120,000 other Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans in the Western states and was incarcerated in assorted camps. Years later, in 1990, on the strength of the Superior Court victory in 1918, the house was granted National Historic Landmark status. Daughter Sumi Harada, one of the three original toddler owners, had by that time lived in the house for most of her life and would continue to live there for several years longer, leaving shortly before her death in 2000. Next slide, please. It's worth noting at this juncture that few value and defend the principles upon which the U.S. was founded quite as fervently as do many new immigrants. Jukichi Harada was among these. He trained as a teacher in Japan, but saw a life of constraint and limitation stretched before him in the Japan of the time. 
He was convinced that the U.S. was a great country and that his family would share in the promise of liberty and justice for all. So he chose to uproot his young family and face the uncertainty of immigration. He arrived first, and his wife Ken and Japanese-born son Masa Asu eventually reunited with him in 1905, which is the approximate date of this photograph. Next slide, please. In 1916, the neighborhood groundswell, <clears throat> excuse me, against the Haradas began with their next door neighbor, Cynthia Robinson, a Civil War widow. It led to a suit brought by the state of California itself. During World War I, the U.S. relationship with Japan was critical, which meant that this case caught the attention of both U.S. and Japanese leadership. It warrants further study to determine, to determine just how much the political situation at the international level may have contributed to the favorable outcome for the Harada family in 1918, when in no way had racial hatred diminished in California. Still, the positive outcome does seem to have been inevitable from today's vantage point, as the Haradas prevailed under the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed the rights of the American-born children, however young they were. Next slide, please. The family enjoyed their victory for about a generation. In 1942, the incarceration of Japanese Americans who had committed no crimes swept the Harada family up along with so many others. Jukichi and Ken both died in the camps. This image is of Ken's funeral in March of 1943. Back home in Riverside, family friend Jess Stebler took care of the house and corresponded frequently with Sumi Harada. Disagreements arose among family members regarding military service, but some did serve. Youngest son, Harold Harada, in particular, served in the 442nd, a Japanese-American regiment that remains the most decorated in U.S. military history. Next slide, please. Sumi Harada was the only family member to return to the house in Riverside, where she lived nearly her entire life. Immediately after the war, she opened the house to boarders who were returning from the camps, but were not so fortunate as to be able to return to their own homes. A crumbling notice to these boarders from the 1940s is still affixed to a bathroom wall. The extraordinary nature of the 1918 legal battle to keep the home was internalized by all family members. Younger family members recall growing up knowing that the house was quote unquote, a test case for the constitutionality of their ownership. After Sumi passed away, her younger brother Harold's children donated the house and its entire contents to the city of Riverside in 2003. And because Sumi rarely discarded anything, this is a treasure trove. Next slide, please. Two major challenges face the city of Riverside and its museum upon accepting ownership. The city was steadfast in stating that funding for the rehabilitation or restoration would have to come from other than city coffers. And two, the structural condition of the house was extremely compromised. This image shows just one example of the degradation and collapse caused by termites and water incursion. In the years since accepting ownership, the city has made significant investments in merely arresting deterioration. Next slide, please. The stars aligned for funding during the pandemic. A growing group of advocates became increasingly effective at articulating the importance of making the house publicly accessible, citing the still current urgency of the social justice messages. The museum benefited from a grant funded preliminary study that began to give a realistic notion of costs. And enough studies had been done and enough understanding of the path forward had been established that the museum was able to secure a federal Save America's Treasures grant in 2020 and get a place on the National Trust for Historic Preservation's 11 Most Endangered Places list. California enjoyed a couple of years of budget surpluses and it helped immeasurably that elected officials such as State Assemblyman Jose Medina, who is pictured here, had himself once been a history teacher and was the standard bearer in California for ethnic studies. At his right is Sarah Mundy, chair at the time of the Harada House Foundation, and with me on the other side of the big check from the state is Aaron Edwards, the then Ward 1 council member, also a tireless advocate for social justice issues. Next slide, please. The technical challenge is presently our greatest. 
We have studied and surveyed the house and lot in every possible way, and now try to find our way to the finish line with a plan that inspires confidence, because the best path, path forward involves lifting up this fragile house in order to rebuild its foundation and then setting it back down on new foundations. Next slide, please. The ultimate goal is a Harada house that's structurally stable into which we can install its original furnishings. Limited guided tours through the house will provide the experience of walking through the house as lived in, not as converted into a museum. Most of our interpretation will occur next door in the Interpretive Center, which happens to be the house formerly known as Robinson House after Cynthia Robinson. Recall that she was the one who started the charge to remove the Haradas from the neighborhood. There is a certain irony here, of course, but it's worth mentioning by the time of Cynthia's death in 1922, she had come to admit that the Haradas were nice people. Next slide, please. Surprises run the gamut. It's a bit surprising how much international attention the project has earned. And I say this because there are so many sites that embody stories of the struggle for justice. We feel privileged that ours has risen to the top for many. Good news includes discovering that termites didn't get everywhere. Good news also includes the interest that the neighbors show in having a landmark on their street. It is still a residential neighborhood. Pictured is a donor appreciation event we did in the street to which we also invited all the neighbors. The neighbor's goodwill is so valuable to us because we rely in part on them to safeguard this unoccupied property through their interest and vigilance. Finally, on the less good news side, the technical planning process has been protracted. We could never have imagined how long it would take. Next slide, please. While the site remains closed to the public, we keep up a steady stream of programming and communications, and I stress how important this is for a site that demands the patience and sympathies of so many. Next slide, please. I close by thanking Sumi Harada, a woman I never met, but whose direct, honest, and even curmudgeonly personality has been shared by many who did know her. She didn't mince words about the challenge the city would face when the house she really couldn't afford to maintain would change ownership. She knew the story mattered, and she kept every scrap of paper relating to it that the family ever had. In the 1980s, she almost begrudgingly befriended the persistent graduate student, Mark Rowich, who would come to write the history and who ensured the landmark status would be awarded. But she reserved judgment on what the outcome would be. Before too many more years have passed, the Museum of Riverside aims to achieve the best possible outcome. Next slide, please. I thank you for your attention and be happy to accept your questions toward the end. All right. That was really inspiring, Robin. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks to all of you for attending today and for everybody who um, watches this online later. Uh, Annalise and I uh, will talk about the ways in which this uh, 11 most listing from last year supercharged our efforts to preserve and activate LV Hall's legacy. And though Annalise and I are the ones speaking to you today, uh, we're just two members of a dedicated alliance of folks who really for over two decades have been working to ensure LV's legacy survives to inspire future generations. Some of those other folks are on the call today. And since many of you may not be familiar with LV, Annalise will provide an introduction. Uh, then we'll share more about her home, the impact of 11 Most, and what's next in this journey. So I'll turn it over to you, Annalise. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yafit. Um, thank you to the National Trust for having us here. Thanks for everyone uh, for tuning in with us today. Um, like Yafit mentioned, um, I have the great pleasure and honor of introducing LV. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so this is LV Hull. Um, she purchased her home in 1974 with wages from domestic work when she was in her early 30s. And actually, the 50th anniversary of her purchase of the home was just a couple weeks ago on August 12th, which was very exciting. Um, LV was an artist for her entire life, but it wasn't until she bought her home and had access to her own space that her practice really took off in remarkable ways. 
She started as a collector, filling her home with precious items, some that she kept for curated displays and others that she sold to other collectors. She eventually started painting using primarily found objects as her canvas and acrylic paint from the local Walmart. She developed a signature style, bright concentrated colors, dots, clever sayings. She called all of this doing the LV. And then she even adorned herself in her work, painting many hats, pairs of shoes and clothing. So you can see in the photo here, she is wearing painted shoes and a beautiful painted hat. Um, next slide, please. And so as I mentioned, um, here are a couple of the hallmarks of LV's practice. So on the left here, we have uh, an example of her, one of her painted signs. Um, some of these sayings she would paint um, are things that she would come across. Um, others we think are things that she came up with herself. LV had a great sense of humor. Um, many of these are reflective of her values and beliefs. Uh, this one says, this one has a couple of the, the gems all together. This one says, uh, I started with nothing and I still have most of it. Take time to appreciate. Do not try to understand me, just love me. And one of my favorites is mind your business. Um, the one in the middle here, the example, this is a placket. Um, that's her term. And so a placket was essentially or is essentially a found object um, assemblage. Uh, she would use um, materials that she would come across or that, again, would be given to her. So costume jewelry, buttons, cigarette lighters, cameos, um, Mardi Gras beads were a big one, um, all kinds of odds and ends to create these. And they sort of act as like tiny time capsules of the time that LV was making this work. And then over here on the right, this is a great example of doing the LV, um, something she also called creating her pretty things. Um, so as I mentioned, one of LV's uh, signatures was were these multicolored dot motifs. Um, she would put dots on just about anything. And often people would bring her things and ask her to do the LV. And so she would decorate um, those objects in this style for them um, as a style of commission. Uh, next slide, please. So all of these different types of making came together to create uh, this art environment in front of her home. So all of this is radiating outward into the front yard and eventually became a dense, evolving, prismatic installation. Not everyone in town appreciated LV's artwork, but she was beloved by many and her home was a beacon of creativity and personal pride in her historically African-American neighborhood in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. So Kosciuszko is uh, directly on the Natchez Trace. It is about an hour northeast of Jackson. It's pretty central, um, a town of about 7,000 people. Um, she was a very active part of her community and created a space not only for private meditation, but also to welcome friends and neighbors for exchanges of plates of food and probably some gossip. Um, LV's work coalesces to form a genre of art making known as an artist-built environment. So an artist-built environment, an art environment, is a personal space like a home, garden, or studio that has been fully transformed into a continually evolving, site-specific, and life-encompassing work of art. So if you want to know more about art environments, you can visit um, spacesarchives.org. Um, I, as was mentioned in my bio, I manage spaces for the Kohler Foundation, um, and it is an archive dedicated to artist-built environments around the world. Um, so check that out. Um, and then some of the facets of LV's work that are hallmarks of an artist-built environment are, as I mentioned, um, site specificity. So LV's work was very much a product of her environment. Um, owning her own home allowed her the autonomy to do exactly as she pleased with her um, home. And then she also lived in an African-American neighborhood where she was surrounded by friends and family. And we can imagine that this sense of community helped give LV the confidence to pursue this very public expression of creativity. Um, another hallmark of art environments is abundance and accumulation. So while LV did make discrete artworks that she sold to patrons, um, in terms of the installations, both inside and outside of her home, all of these separate pieces come together to form one cohesive work of art that is more than the sum of its parts. 
And then in terms of the artwork that you're seeing here, you may be wondering what happened to this. So after LV passed away in 2008, a group of supporters of LV called the Friends of LV, we have a friend here today named Alan Massey, thank you Alan, um, formed to figure out the next steps for her creations um, and work with her sister QT Tenen to settle the estate. So they salvaged as much of the artwork from the site as possible and packed it safely for storage in Kosciuszko in 2010. And then recently, the Kohler Foundation conserved that collection of approximately 850 works of art, and we will talk more about the plans for that collection in a bit. Um, and my final note on LV's work as an art environment, though this is not a complete list of what might make something an art environment, um, is evolution of the home and of her artwork. So LV was constantly adding to and altering this work of art. She, it, We can trace in photos how it continued to grow and grow and grow. Um, this photo is from 1997. We have photos from the early 2000s where it has built up even higher and more densely. Um, one fun thing that we discovered in the archive is that there is a, a, a mask of Mr. T that's installed and we get to watch it over the years. It starts out as Mr. T and then he has face paint and then the, the paint changes over time. Um, so LV was never done with this. Um, and so one of the exciting things about the continual evolution of this site is, is that we have heard from kids in the neighborhood that they would ask their parents, can you please take me by Miss LV's house? Um, I want to see what she's changed in the yard. And so we have one of those kids with us right now. I'm going to turn it over to him. I'm back. Thank you. At least that was great. Yeah. So I first encountered LV when I was about four or five years old. And she lived uh, four houses from my grandmother. And uh, my cousins and I had to pass her house to go to the corner store. I was scared of her at first because people said she practiced voodoo. But then one day, one day she gave us some freeze pops, kind of like a popsicle. And I realized this lady's OK. And um, she really stuck with me, I think, because she was the first person I encountered whose life was dedicated to creativity. And I pursued sort of a traditional creative path, but her example stuck with me as I was transitioning from accountant to lawyer to screenwriter. And I wanted to revisit her as an, as an adult. And my wife had bought me a video camera. So I started recording LV way back in 2001 with the goal of allowing her to star in a story of her own. Um, next slide, Pete, please. So that is uh, what looks like could be my son, but it's actually me uh, during one of my trips to record LV in 2003. And as I worked on the film and recorded her, I came to recognize the way that she merged art making and the Southern art of visiting to transform her home into a space to commune with her inner spirit, her creator, friends, neighbors, and the many visitors who came to see her from around the world. And so this home, this environment was an outer manifestation of her inner spirit. And in fact, in the documentary, one of the visitors says, you can't tell where the art stops and LV begins. Next slide, please. Now, this is her home in 2021. Uh, it looks pretty much like this today. You can see the art environment is gone which could seem sad in a way, uh, but the home itself, uh, as Annalise alluded to, had a deep personal meaning for LV. You know, she had not just a room of her own, but an entire home of her own. And it unleashed the freedom to be her true self, the freedom to craft this wonderland that she created. And her DNA is still there. Next slide. So you can see this is one example of the faded spots uh, and the nails on the wall where she uh, hung her collections and her artwork. And it creates this landscape of her imagination. And it has been a really moving experience for people to actually see the place where she created this special world. But unfortunately in 2021, we were in, we were in danger of losing this home. And the home was not part of the original excuse me, preservation efforts. Uh, there was the Friends Group commissioned a preservation study uh, that really realized that for security reasons, given the 
um, how tight the street was and LV not being present, that it really wasn't going to be feasible to maintain her environment as it was. But fortunately, those friends helped settle a lien that Medicare had on the house working with QT and sold the house to a neighbor. But unfortunately, in 2021, that neighbor had health issues, lost the home to an investor. Uh, and so this is kind of a moment of truth, uh, both historically and personally. And many of you listening may be in a similar situation. So from a historical perspective, the homes of Black female uh, visual artists typically don't survive, let alone the homes of Black female environment builders. For example, Nellie Mae Rowe's home in Georgia is now a hotel. Uh, but if I could buy the house, then this was a chance to save this home and change the story of art that we tell through our preserved structures. But personally, this home was a hallowed space. It really memorializes memories and inspiration for me and the thousands of visitors who came to see her. And Annalise has talked about the spirit of generosity that kind of pervades this project. And so fortunately, uh, I got the blessing of the uh, neighbor who owned the home uh, to go ahead and buy the home. And I was able to buy the home, but that started a new story of how to save the home and figure out what exactly um, to do with it. And fortunately, Annalise introduced us to Rachel Reichert, uh, who used to manage something called the James Castle House, who said, you have to talk to Valerie Ballant of the uh, Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program of the National Trust. And so Valerie served as our gateway to the National Trust, encouraged us to apply for 11 most uh, as a way to establish the importance of the home and attract funds. And so next slide, please. So here we all are uh, after being named to the 11 most list, list in May uh, 2023. This is a great portrait of the community uh, and the energy and unity result that resulted from being on 11 most. Our banner says you can't spell 11 without LV. And just quickly, there's a lot of community pride around being listed, particularly uh, for residents of the neighborhood, showing that what happens in this neighborhood is worthy of recognition. It's been a catalyst um, for the neighborhood. Three long vacant homes are now being uh, renovated, and we're hoping it can be a catalyst for more of the African-American history in Kosciuszko. Uh, things like James Meredith's childhood home is on the same street as LV's home. There's a strong history of African-American education. And of course, Oprah Winfrey uh, is from Kosciuszko. And then, but the uh, some of the other impacts uh, are the insights and advice we've gotten from the 11 most team, including Chris Morris, uh, who was mentioned earlier, I think as uh, leading the Where Women Made History program. And we were able to use that advice to apply for funding. And we were fortunate to get funding from the African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund and the Lower Mississippi Delta Initiative of the National Park Service, about $75,000. We still need more, but that seed funding allowed us to bring on renowned architects, Belinda Stewart Architects for Preservation of the Home. They've worked on projects like the Emmett Till Memory Project, and hopefully soon we'll be able to join that Historic Artists uh, Homes and Studios program and save the home, which can then become the spiritual cornerstone of the LV Hall Legacy Center. Next slide, please. So here's just an aerial view of the Legacy Center at the bottom in purple is LV's home. And then just about four houses away, about 40 yards is the main arts complex site. And this site is significant because um, one, uh, Annalise has mentioned in the past how most self-taught artists or art environment builders, their work does not stay in their community or in the context in which it was created. And that is really important for LV's story. And so this will keep her work there in Kosciuszko. And then the other is that this street is literally at the intersection of LV Street and the world. So folks would travel on this main thoroughfare, Huntington, from the Natchez Trace uh, into the town square past LV's house. And this is, excuse me, how they would access LV's house. 
And that lot in particular, circled in yellow, um, was owned by a family that was friends with LV. They owned a monuments business that was located there. And they would allow tour buses to park there so people could walk down the street and visit LV. And Annalise will now share more about our plans for the Legacy Center. Next slide. Great. Um, so this is the this is the Legacy Center campus from the street. Um, and then just to give you guys a quick overview of what these facilities will be used for. So the building on the left will be our primary exhibitions um, and collection space. So I mentioned that the Kohler Foundation had conserved that collection. So it will be on permanent display in that structure, um, as well as a uh, uh, facilities for rotating exhibitions, media and archive space, um, you know, for public access and public research. Um, in this middle structure here, we will have staff offices, programmatic space, and then another very exciting thing is that we plan to host a creative residency at the Legacy Center, where they will have access to materials from um, LV, our collection of LV's work, but then also be able to walk right down the street and um, take in her home. Um, and then on the right here, um, we have this small white building that will be converted into uh, an artist studio. So space um, for folks to come and make whatever they want while they're inspired by the spirit of LV. Um, and you can learn a lot more about this on our website, um, lvhall.org. Um, and then this has been our really big news lately, but we have more big news to share um, on the next slide which is that the LV Hall Home and Studio is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places at the level of national significance, um, which is very exciting for lots of reasons, um, two of which that this is the first uh, home studio of a um, Black woman visual artist to be added to the National Register at the level of national significance. Um, there are several other home studios that have been added, um, Augusta Savage and um, Alma Thomas, but those are at, listed at state uh, level of recognition. And then also this is the first um, art environment of a Black art environment creator to be listed on the National Register at all. So we are very excited about this. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, uh, Yafit will finish us out here. Yeah, so uh, I just want to touch on the, the National Register of Significance. The reason, one of the reasons we sought that is because uh, we care about LV as a person, not just a means to an end here. And that home really represents her life. And so we're really overjoyed about that and hope it sparks more recognition of more homes and uh, but we wouldn't have nearly as much momentum as we have without the 11 most listing. There's more to come. Annalise, uh, Ryan Dennis from the Contemporary Art Museum Houston and I are uh, working with the Mississippi Museum of Art to curate an exhibition there, as well as developing a book about LV. There will be the release of the documentary in conjunction with that exhibition and the opening of the Legacy Center. Dates are all still to be determined, so please use the QR code here, sign up for our newsletter to stay up uh, to date, or you can sign up on our brand new website that uh, Annalise mentioned, and we hope to welcome you all to Kosciuszko soon. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll pass the torch to my Texas neighbor, Lindsay, to discuss the Cindy Walker House. Thank you so much to Yafit and uh, Annalise. It, they're incredibly um, inspiring. And in fact, when we went um, at the Cindy Walker Foundation through the process, we looked to them as an example um, and inspiration for our application and what we were hoping to do as well with the legacy of Cindy Walker. Just quickly, my name is Lindsay Lippman. I'm the executive director of the Cindy Walker Foundation. And um, we like to call Cindy an accidental feminist, and I am an accidental historic preservationist. I definitely did not get into this um, thinking we'd be saving a home and then um, building an organization, a nonprofit foundation through her legacy. But here we are, um, and we're very excited about what's in store and what we've already um, accomplished. Um, first, the Cindy Walker Foundation story started with a plan to save her home. It's located 
in Mejia, Texas, which is my hometown um, as well. I grew up there my whole life. And I became aware of Cindy Walker, who lived in Mejia, Texas from 1954 until her passing in 2006, when she was inducted as the first female songwriter into the Country Music Hall of Fame in 1997. That's when she really uh, got onto my radar personally as a country music fan. I never got to meet her in person, but now feel very close to her and her family members throughout this entire process. I say that I'm an accidental uh, preservationist because this all started with a plan uh, to tell her story through a documentary, which started in 2021. So I went back to my hometown and um, I don't currently live there. I live just north of Austin. And I'm a television news anchor in the Waco TV market. I went back to her home and my jaw dropped. I didn't understand why it was in such disrepair, as you can see from the picture. And I felt like uh, something much more than just telling her story needed to be done because it was very clear to me that the home was uh, in danger. And if, if something didn't happen soon, the home would be lost. If we could go to uh, the next slide, please. So first, who was Cindy Walker? Uh, Cindy Walker was the first female songwriter inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame, the first female board member of the Country Music Association. She testified twice before Congress for songwriters' rights, and she had top 10 hits in five consecutive decades from the 1940s to the 1980s. And we like to say before there was Taylor Swift, before there was Dolly Parton, there was Cindy Walker. She created most of her songs, her music, she um, didn't have co-writers. She wrote it all on her own in her very modest home in Mejia, Texas. She was born in Texas um, on a farm in Mart, which is about 30 minutes from Mejia in Central Texas. That's east of Waco and south of Dallas. And she started her uh, songwriting career by moving to Hollywood in her early 20s. And she walked into Bing Crosby's office and said, I've got a song that I want Bing to hear. At the time, Bing Crosby was at the very height of his fame and popularity. He pretty much was as famous as famous gets. And Cindy had the bravada to just walk in and say, I want him to hear one of the songs. Well, Bing wasn't there, but his brother Larry was. And uh, Cindy was able to perform that song, Lone Star Trail, for him. And he liked it so much that he had her go to the Paramount lot, uh, Paramount lot the next day. And she sung it for Bing, and Bing recorded it. And that was her very first cut. Cindy made a decision in 1947 while in Hollywood that she wanted to solely focus on songwriting. She um, had appearances in, in films, in Western films, um, in Gene Autry's films, and she wrote 38 songs for Bob Will's films as well. That was uh, during that time period during World War II where um, Westerns were very popular. Everybody wanted to be a cowboy, and Cindy was very much instrumental um, in that whole movement. But uh, at some point, her brother, she had an older brother who was living in Mejia, Texas with his three daughters. He made the phone call to Hollywood and say, hey, I want mama and I want you to come back to Texas. And she thought, well, I can write a song in Hollywood just as easy as I can in Texas. And so that's why she moved back to uh, Mejia, Texas. Next slide, please. So this is the home where she wrote her biggest hit, um, which includes You Don't Know Me. That was originally recorded by Eddie Arnold and then later uh, a top hit by Ray Charles. Many of you have probably heard the Ray Charles version, but that song has been recorded by hundreds of artists, including um, Elvis. Frank Sinatra has sung her songs, Cher, Bette Midler, um, of course, Bob Wills, a lot of the... Um, the folks that were popular in Nashville, including Jim Reeves, Ernest Tubb, and the list uh, goes on and on, Loretta Lynn. It's very interesting to note, though, that um, as a female songwriter, she was writing music for men. And so she was putting herself in the position of writing a song from a male perspective, and she was getting these hits. Um, she worked as a songwriter Basically, I would explain as like a farmer would work the land. She woke up at 5 a.m. every day. She went up to her writer's studio um, on the second floor of her home, and she would just work those songs until she had a song that she felt was good enough. Roy Orbison made her song uh, Dream Baby a hit as well. 
So I already covered that she moved back to Mejia in 19, or moved to Mejia in 1954 uh, at her home on 114 South Brook Street until her death in 2006. It's very much a residential um, area. Um, basically, Mejia is a rural community. Uh, no more than 7,000 people live there. Uh, healthcare and agriculture are basically the main employers as well as the local um, school district. When I came along in 2021, wanting to do a documentary film, um, I went to the home and the front door, you can see in this picture, there's the screen door, but the front door was wide open. And I looked into the property, it looked completely abandoned, but I could see that there were items inside. And it was very mysterious and confusing as to why this famous songwriter's home would be abandoned and, and left um, in the way that it was. I investigated and found out that when Cindy passed away in 2006, she left the royalties of her published music to the Country Music Hall of Fame. She left the home to her beloved caretaker, Willie Mae Atkinson. Willie Mae Atkinson didn't have any children either, and when she died in 2019, the home then went to her brother, W.D. Atkinson. So uh, my mission at that time was just to find where W.D. was and what the status of the home was as well. The home was already in um, tax foreclosure, so taxes weren't being paid, and the home had fallen into um, a state of disrepair. I was able to locate uh, WD. I also located Cindy Walker's uh, surviving, surviving family members, including two nieces who are wonderful people and have become partners in this effort. And so for nine months from that point on, um, I negotiated with WD to find out if he'd be willing to sell the home, what his plans were for it, and if he agreed um, that the foundation would be able to purchase the home and, and then try to restore it. Our entire motto this entire time has been, let's just try, because we didn't know structurally if the home could be saved. We didn't know if WD would sell it. Uh, we agreed on a price, and that is when we formed the foundation and started fundraising to purchase the, the home. The home was purchased in September of uh, 2022. And when we went into the home, we realized that it wasn't just the home we were saving. We found approximately 75 unheard, unpublished Cindy Walker songs that were on reel-to-reel -reel demos um, that had never been heard before. And, and frankly, if there hadn't been intervention, that music would have been lost forever. We also found hundreds of demos um, including the Ray Charles demo of You Don't Know Me and some other uh, historic artifacts. So artifacts were in abundance. It was truly a time capsule. Willie May had not touched t Cindy's things and left things almost like Willie May was a curator of, of, a, of a Cindy Walker museum. And so we found um, clothing and uh, historic documents that truly tell Cindy's story um, as well. Next slide. So we've been going along in this um, preservation uh, process. Our plan is to uh, restore the home and um, earn national and state historic designations. As part of that, we were listed on Preservation Texas's most endangered list in 2022, and they encouraged us to apply for the 11 most endangered list. So this is a picture of that event. It was called our announcement event. It was called Songs and Sundays. Cindy was, even though she wrote songs about honky tonks and drinking and things like that, she did not drink and she did not smoke, um, but she made a very good ice cream sundae. And so we found Cindy's ice cream sundae uh, recipe and we served that to all the folks there we had live music. And you see a lot of the people from uh, Mejia and Limestone County uh, cutting the ribbon on the restoration. Um, the 11 most designation for us was a huge turning point. It garnered national media coverage, increased local and state support. People started to realize that it's more than just a house and it's a place where uh, Cindy Walker made history. And while she didn't seek the spotlight it's a history that's worth saving. It's a story worth telling. Um, we've also had increased donations as well. And then we've also received um, matching grant funding. So when we've gone out and, um, and earned a grant, we go back to the city of Mejia and we say, this is 
the grant we've earned and through HOT uh, tax funding, um, we have been given matching grant. And I, I believe that all of that momentum is thanks to the 11 most uh, designation where other people are starting to realize this is something we can be proud of for our community and it's a legacy for Mejia to, um, to, to cultivate and share with the world. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the challenges, progress, and what's ahead, you can see some of the restoration effort underway. All of the critical repairs um, on the house, we were through the grant funding able to get the um, historic preservation plan in place. And so the critical repairs will be finished before the end of 2024. We believe it will take at least two years to get through some of those high priority um, re restoration efforts, including an all new foundation, a new roof. I mean, the home um, is in dire straits. But uh, I was just speaking about some of the artifacts that we found, uh, including her country music. She had all of her awards underneath her mattress, um, <laughs> which is kind of a window into Cindy's world. And then you can see a Texas Country Reporter filming. They learned about um, our story through the 11 most designation. Some of the challenges, though, quickly were ownership. We didn't know if we were going to be able to have ownership of the home, but we were able uh, to work that out through time. Time is also a problem because we are in a race against the clock with the home structural issues. So it's it's very urgent, these repairs that need to be made. And then the other thing is we, our board um, and our group of volunteers, we are just that, volunteers. I've got a full-time job and four kids, um, but much like Yafit, I felt like if somebody didn't do something, if I didn't do something, who would? I, I knew I had to step up and, and try to take on this important work. And so um, the wonderful thing is there's been a, a, a group of people that are working just as hard as I do, but we we don't have funding for a full-time staff. And so um, we're working as quickly and as diligently as we can. Um, and one of the things that has been wonderful through all of this is the neighborhood support, because this is a neighborhood. Our plan is to, um, to turn it into a community art and music space to have um, children, music lessons for kids, educational programming out of the house, and then her upstairs writing studio having that more as an exhibit space um, for Cindy Walker. We plan to have songwriter retreats as well as a songwriter residency program in town. And it has energized the community of Mejia um, to really get involved in, in preserving this home and also having Cindy Walker's legacy as something that drives economic uh, activity and tourism to um, our small town. And you can learn more at cindywalkerfoundation.org. Thanks so much for your time, Jennifer. Oh, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Sorry, my camera's readjusting here. Um, that was just incredibly inspirational to all of you. Um, we we don't have a lot of time for Q&A. We have one question I think that, um, Lindsay, perhaps you can quickly answer about whether the Country Music Hall of Fame has offered any funds towards the restoration of the home since they own the rights to the songs of Cindy Walker. Um, well, I do want to clear that up quickly. They don't own the copyright to the music. Music is like um, a piece of land that you lease. And they, um, what the Country Music Hall of Fame was willed was the royalties. So from, she was a BMI songwriter. So they received those funds. We have directly asked for funding from the Country Music Hall of Fame. And they have um, replied with more of a partnership. No, no dollars coming to us. But for example, our documentary will be screened um, at the Country Music Hall of Fame in March during Women's History Month. And so we are trying to leverage those partnerships to increase funding to be able to um, save the home. But um, we've had quite a few organizations like the Country Music Hall of Fame that have come along with a partnership. I hope that answered the question. Great. The new music, however, um, those royalties will go to the estate of Cindy Walker once that new music is released. Yes, and I think there is a way on the Cindy Walker Foundation website to hear a song that's among the songs that were found in the house and make a donation to support their efforts. So um, I hope you all will visit and support each of these incredible projects. It's just been, a, for me, a personal honor to, to get to work with each of you. And I, I thank you so much for sharing your stories today. It's so inspirational, particularly 
the ways in which you're creating museum spaces, but they're really community spaces and they're engaging the community, especially in thinking about ongoing art and music making. And I just, I think that's incredible. So thank you all. Um, I just wanna share next slide, a few upcoming preservation leadership forum webinars to keep an eye out for. Uh, on September 19th, we have Architecture and Identity, Black Modernism. And on October 7th, we have Activating the Power of Place, a conversation with the leadership of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And we also have a special forum member only webinar, Mandeville, Louisiana's journal, Journey to Flood Adaptation on September 25th. Next slide, please. And lastly, we hope to see many of you in person this year at the annual preservation conference, Past Forward, being held in New Orleans, October 28th through the 30th. This annual gathering will also kick off a celebration of the 75th anniversary of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Registrations open now at savingplaces.org backslash conference. And with that, thank you all for attending and thank you so much to our, our speakers today. <laughs>